All right, imagine we're a long time ago and life isn't around yet. We've got some of the building blocks needed for life just hanging out. What are the next steps in chemical evolution that we would need to turn these little dudes into something actually living? Forming biopolymers. What's a biopolymer? That's when our building blocks team up and link together in long chains. This is what life's molecules are made out of, from DNA and RNA to proteins. Everything needs them to live, so biopolymers are kind of important. In order for chemical evolution to have taken place, nature would need a way to assemble biopolymers. But like hiding your tuna sandwich in a room full of cats, it's a very hard thing to do. Some scientists claim that it was no big deal though. They contend that under the right conditions, making biopolymers is easy enough, and from there, life could flow naturally. But is this really the case? Let's take a look more closely. These building blocks are kind of like fish. They don't have legs. And without something to float around in, they can't get around like they need to in order to do stuff. Because all known life requires water, it is commonly seen as the solution to this problem. Water allows these molecules to bump around and knock into each other, which could help link the monomers into a chain. So, water is needed, but water is actually a big problem as well for two reasons. Like bringing your mom with you on a date, water can slow down or stop chemistry. Water molecules dilute the building blocks, pushing them further apart from one another making it less likely that they'll be able to interact. Also, water actively breaks down these polymers. Bazillions of water molecules are speeding around and constantly smacking polymer chains around. This frequently breaks the bonds, cutting the chain to pieces, something called hydrolysis. We need a liquid for these building blocks to link up, but the liquid also prevents and destroys the links. That's what makes it a paradox. Some have suggested that wet and dry cycles, or salts, may be able to fix some of these problems. However, wet-dry cycles actually degrade DNA or RNA by removing nucleobases, creating abasic sites. Formation of a biopolymer chain is actually very difficult in wet-dry conditions. Proteins in particular have an additional challenge. Like a balloon animal that relies on air to support its shape, proteins rely on water to support their complex three-dimensional form. When you remove water from a protein, it tends to fall apart, something called denaturation. Many proteins will just irreversibly collapse when dried out. Well, if water is such a problem, what if we just used a different solvent? Geochemists laugh at the idea of large amounts of a different solvent on Earth. We just don't have pools of formamide or methane or whatever lying around. Also, all of the other potential solvents tend to be very volatile as well. They evaporate quickly, or they're only produced in low concentrations, or they're only liquid at temperatures that are incredibly hostile to life, or they're nonpolar, or they're typically produced by biological activity. In other words, there are a lot of problems with using something other than water, and you can't get many of these solvents needed for life unless you already have life. More complex molecules frequently have something called chirality. You can have the same molecule, just in different forms. Like you have two hands, one left hand and one right hand. All but one of the 20 amino acid building blocks have chirality. Except for glycine, he's pretty silly. The crazy thing about life is that all proteins, all DNA, all RNA, all cell membranes must have the correct chirality or else life would cease to exist. Think of it like molecules having an evil twin. Here is a portion of insulin. According to this paper, if any one of these had the evil twin, the wrong chiral form, it could no longer form the 3D structure properly. If you have a long molecule like DNA, you don't just need the right chirality once. It has to be correct in every one of the half a million nucleotides in the simplest free living form of life. Well, what about these papers? They show ways to preferentially filter or select one chiral form over another. So I guess it's not that big of a deal. Actually, the most successful proof of concept is from this paper, but it's an open secret in the field that the chemistry that's required for this method couldn't have happened on a prebiotic Earth. A lot of people, we, our group included, are trying to find more prebiotically relevant reactions that could do what the SOI reaction does. So far, we haven't been able to find one, so that's a kind of a holy grail. 
This experiment and others like it are interesting, but basically classified as prebiotically irrelevant. Natural processes are well known to produce equal portions of the two different chiral forms. That's what nature does. Filtering out only one form over another is very unnatural. There's no process that we know of on the prebiotic Earth that could have done this. But it gets worse. It's not as simple as having an evil twin, just left or right-handed chirality. Adenosine, for instance, has 15 evil twins, or 16 chiral forms. It's the identical chemical formula to the other nucleosides. It's still C10H13 and 5O4, but if you slot one of these evil twins into a creature, bad stuff happens. Fun fact. Platypus venom contains a protein that can flip amino acids of its victims to the wrong chirality, causing devastating pain. You dirty little chirality flipping platypus Every biopolymer has a chirality problem. So how does modern science deal with it? Well, they largely ignore it. You could read thousands of pages in college-level textbooks or popular works, specifically on biology and the origins of life, and never even come across the concept of chirality. Diagrams that we find in our textbooks may make it seem like there's only one way for things to link up. But linking together different building blocks is hard. The reality is that there are far more ways for these little dudes to link together incorrectly than correctly. Specifically, there's four different kinds of ways that it can go wrong. Number one, intramolecular cyclization. If the bit at the end links to the bit at the front, making a circle, it's lights out for that polymer. He's dead. Number two. Heterogeneous impurities. Interfering molecules or the wrong molecule could again spell death for a fledgling polymer. Three, branching malformation. You could have the right thing but have it linking to the wrong spot on another building block. Or number four, premature truncation. There are monomers that act as terminators. Not that kind of terminator. They prevent further growth. Polymers can go wrong in so many different ways. And the longer one gets, the probability of achieving correct links goes down exponentially. Anyway, with all of the smart people working on this problem for so many years, how's the progress coming? Let's take a trek through science. Trek through science! Well, in the 90s, they were able to make a chain, a polymer, that was 11 monomers long. More recent experiments showed that they were able to get a chain up to 50 monomers long. Progress. Unfortunately, more recent papers have shown that these claims were wrong and not reproducible. But regardless of whether they've made a polymer that is this long or this long, even that is with extensive coddling and unnatural cheating. See this video for more information about that. When we remember that the simplest known free living organism's genome is more than 500,000 nucleotides long, the argument sort of becomes moot. Life is so far in the distance as to be imperceptible. If, by some miracle, a polymer was able to contend with the water paradox, the chirality problem, and linkage issues, it's got a whole lot more to worry about. It has to face deadly heat, UV rays, mechanical wear and tear, ionizing radiation from the Earth, free radicals, and other forces waiting to pounce and break things down. But, if you had enough time though, surely anything could happen, right? Meet Manfred Eigen. He realized that the information in RNA or DNA that's required to maintain life would experience an error catastrophe without complex enzymes that can recognize and fix this damage to DNA. Without these error correction systems, you would essentially die of old age before you were even born. Fortunately for us, all living things are equipped with complex repair mechanisms. Unfortunately for abiogenesis, these mechanisms need to be encoded within DNA. But the DNA can't exist without the repair mechanisms. This is Eigen's paradox. A chicken and egg problem that has been around without a solution for decades. We can't have long strands of DNA or RNA unless it can repair itself. But it can't repair itself unless you have long strands of DNA. Producing any biopolymer through purely natural processes is a huge, frustrating, intractable challenge to science. 
But life is not based on a few random biopolymers, though. Life requires thousands and thousands of highly specific biopolymers with very precise arrangements of monomers. Even if you could get biopolymers to form by natural processes, keeping them intact is quite another challenge. RNA is so unstable that it needs to be kept in deep freeze, away from sunlight, and it has to be thrown out if it's left at room temperature for more than just a few hours. RNA spoils about as fast as a tall glass of milk on a hot summer day. And we're supposed to believe that molecules like RNA not only existed for millions of years, but also replicated and became more complex. You can believe that if you want, but it'll be in spite of the evidence and not because of it. Hey, if you've watched this far, thanks. If you're not subscribed already, go ahead and do that, it's free. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I read every single one. Thanks again. Thank you.